You're listening to Cotton Tales Podcast, part of the Silicon Valley Black Project, which produced the documentary film, A Place at the Table, about the black pioneers of Silicon Valley. A Place at the Table can be viewed for rent on Vimeo.com, on demand, backslash A Place at the Table stem. Through Cotton Tales Podcast, the Silicon Valley Black Project will continue to recognize the contributions made by African Americans. We will be featuring African American professionals, technologists in the fields of engineering, administration, and entrepreneurial pursuits from the past and present. Today, We are talking with Gloria Young, former city official in Palo Alto and San Francisco. Gloria excelled at every level as she was promoted up the managerial ladder, winning her city, state, national, and global recognition for her management techniques. She has traveled throughout the world, working in corporations, training management teams. Now, I see you are a native San Franciscan. Yes, and um, what I wanted to share as we opened was, you know, I gave this a great deal of thought. Each part of my life, as I suspect others, is a book in the encyclopedia, and from A to Z, it tells our whole story. Mm. So I looked at that in terms of how I would share my story. So yes, I was born in San Francisco, and um, I was raised by a single mother who raised four of us. Um, I have a brother and uh, two sisters, all younger than me. And since my mother was a single parent, I was critical in the raising of my brother and sister in San Francisco. Um, My mother was of a strong faith um, in Christ, and she raised us um, with that that strength. Um, She struggled to uh, work several jobs. Um, She started out in Stanford at Stanford Hospital here in San Francisco before it went to um, Stanford down in the peninsula. Mm -hmm. So it was, the hospital was up here and she worked for the hospital. And um, so, you know, we, we grew up with um, that kind of faith and a strong sense of character. Mm -hmm. And um, she really ensured our education. She paid for us to go to a you know, Christian parochial school. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so that's kind of my my upbringing um, with my mom. And I learned early on at the age of six, because she was struggling, I started selling Christmas cards and I started selling those little wall hangings that you'd see in people's homes. Mm-hmm. It was made out of felt, so the felt would fall off, but people would buy them anyway from me because I was you know, six years old walking around in the Catholic school uniform. And so, you know, folks would buy it even if they didn't want it. (laughs) He said, you know, here, take the money and please don't bring us back when the cards come or the little things, but it worked, you know. I was able to collect that money and um, to help. And, you know, I I did babysitting um, as well to help as I went through my grammar school and high school to help my mother with the tuition as well. So that is a story that is rarely ever uh, pointed out is that, you know, yes, we all struggled. A lot of black families did, but the young, the oldest children usually stepped in and, and tried to help. And you were one of yes. those. Uh, yes. How about your other sisters and brothers? How far uh, are you in age that you were they able to help? My you? brother is um, four years younger than me. And um, my ne- my sister that's next in line is one year younger than her. Okay. Than him, and then my um, my little sister is the youngest of us, and she's eight years younger than me. Ah, yeah, you yeah. then you were, you were the oldest child without a whole. Oh lot yes, of people oh yes, yeah. And you know, one of the things that I did, I think I learned early on. Um, I started working as a candy striper early on. You know, uh, at the same hospital that my mother was working at. You know, seeing her and the kind of personality and strength that she had and she always told us you know you need to give back so that was a part of it as that well. started but then you know you had to be willing to give back because some people are told to get give back at a very early age but yet they don't follow through 
Right. Um, well, so. you know, my, my mother, she constantly told us, there's four of you and you are interdependent. You need to take care of each other. You know, I'm not here because I'm working. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I became the one that went over their homework, you know, the ones that got them up to school in the morning because she had to be at work at five and all of those kinds of things. So I think when I think back, you know, there were no um, mistakes in terms of who I arrived at and, and who I'm arriving to be. Yes. There's no book that can teach you that. No, it's really not. It's our life journey that teaches us so many things. And I think um, if we're paying to attention to it, yeah, then it helps us to grow. You know, if we're actively paying attention and watching those things in our life, it's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. So, so did you, when you graduated from high school, what college did you go to? Yes, well, I graduated from Presentation High, which was an all-girls school here in San Francisco. Um, I had to, again, uh, that's where I also worked to pay my tuition because the tuition was extremely high. Um, there's so many people that went to uh, presentations. You know, I was surrounded by um, people that were making a difference in the world, and um, I was grateful for that. I also went to San Francisco City College. I went to Wharton Business School and got a business certificate from there. Um, I also was certified as a master municipal clerk because I became a municipal clerk in Palo Alto. And I went to, did some programs uh, through UC Santa Cruz as well. I also later on became a trainer of trainer uh, for other public officials throughout the state and throughout the nation. And so I'll, I'll share a bit about that when we get to it. You know, because I did get married and um, I had two children. I ended up being divorced. And so I raised my two children as a divorcee. And um, one of the things that led me to the Silicon Valley is because my son was born with uh, disabilities. Mm -hmm. And also, the climate here in San Francisco was not um, good for him. So they suggested that I move to the peninsula, and I ended up moving to Mountain View. So that brought you then to the Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley. <laughs> well, now, was that in the 70s or 80s when you moved? That was in the 70s. Okay. Um, I arrived in um, about 71, 72, I arrived in um, Silicon Valley and worked for a number of corporations from San Jose um, to Palo Alto. I worked in, uh, as a temporary for a number of those organizations. And um, this is a longer story, but um, I eventually uh, had a temporary position with the city of Palo Alto. So that began my career in 1973. I was, I was hired as a temporary employee. And when I think about my influencers, one of the first influencers was um, the city manager, and his name was George Seifel. Because I excelled, mm -hmm. I think more than they ever expected, um, and took on projects that they, they were surprised I took on in a temporary capacity mm -hmm. that um, the city manager who I had not met came up to me and said, you know, you have a reputation already and you've only worked here for a month and a half. And so what he said to me is, we really want you to stay in this organization. So will you go down to HR, human resources and apply? And so I did and I applied and um, within two weeks I was hired by the city's planning department. And I started working there as a secretary um, to the assistant planning director. And, um, you know, I keep in mind that Palo Alto at that time was 90% um, European descent, you know. Um, so the majority of people working for the city reflected that as well. There were probably maybe five to 10 African Americans in that city hall building um, in their main structure. And I happened to be one of them. And so um, I, you know, that was clear to me that I definitely needed to pay attention, to work hard, mm -hmm. and to excel better than my colleagues and others that worked around me. And so um, I strove to do that. And the results were blessings that came my way. In the planning department, working there, I began to take on some of the positions and some of the 
uh, responsibilities that the planners did, you know, um, whether they were doing condominium conversion or other kinds of reporting systems, I would say, I could do that. You know, after being a secretary and you're typing it up, I thought, I can do that research. I can do I can do that. And so I started taking on their projects, which released them to do other things. So again, it, I was learning and I was uh, applying. Yeah. Um, that was an eye-opener to me as well, because as I said before, um, the, the opportunity to be able to engage in that kind of work afforded me the opportunity to, um, to have the senior management respect me. Mm-hmm. And um, they looked to me when they were hiring other professionals in the organization. You know, what do you think? And here's what we've heard, seen in the interview. And, and, you know, asking me for my comments. And so I was able to speak into people being hired. I was able to speak into when I thought that there was things happening around me that was unfair um, treatment. I would speak to that as well. The reality of being an African-American, being raised by my mother and seeing the strength was strength I had in me. It was, you know, obviously as a single parent, your income is critical. You know, and so um, there was a moment even in that place where I was challenged in terms of uh, I felt unfair treatment and um, I didn't feel that um, because of my work um, doing the, the planning planners work, I was asked to take responsibility for the planning commission. And so when um, there was a situation that occurred that uh, I had I felt was unfair. There didn't seem to be any resolution to that unfairness. <laughs> I typed up my letter of resignation, <laughs> put it on the planning department director's desk, and I left the organization and took one copy down to the HR department. There was an African-American woman who worked in the um, HR department, and before I could even get home, my phone was ringing. You know, I mean, my, my, <laughs> my I mean, it was crazy. The phones were ringing, and um, I got home, and people going, "What happened? You know, <laughs> what went on?" And um, you know, I wasn't willing to share the circumstances, but I just said, "I think I need to exit the organization." Uh, well, the powers that be there. Uh, felt that that was not the case and that they weren't going to lose me. (laughs) Over that weekend, there were phone calls to me and asked me to come back in. And so we had some really um, incredible sit-down conversations. And um, the upshot of that was, you know, what would it take to keep you? And uh, it was an apology, number one. And uh, the second thing was that I wanted a different position in salary. And I got it. Fabulous. (laughs) Fabulous. <laughs> Fabulous. You, you know, you spoke up for yourself. You spoke yes. up for yourself. I also feel like I spoke up for others as yeah. well. You know, I, I spoke up for not being allowed to, to be abused um, and that because of being in a position where they, you know, you, you might be seen as being needy, mm-hmm. that that would affect you in terms of you know, maybe backing down from something rather than saying, I need to draw the line in the sand. Yeah. But you know, it was very hard in the 70s for women. We were just getting our voice, if you remember. The women's movement was at, was at high tide right then. And we were also tr- having internal issues within the, the groups themselves, the women themselves, as to how you speak out and, and who you can speak to and who had the power. And so I think... With, in your case, you you had worked in that position long enough to know all where the bodies were buried. And that, that's the beauty of having that type of coming up through the ranks is that you know so much about an organization. Right? And I wasn't going to be put in a box. I wasn't going to be stereotyped. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had seen some, you know, as I said before, I, I, I believe that um, there might have been, besides June, I think there might have been one other person that was in a pro- professional position. She wasn't the city manager there. She was the director of libraries. Um, but what I saw was um, this that there was a need for respectability. Yes. There was a need that there weren't very many of us um, to begin with. Mm-hmm. So there were all these things coming down the pike. Um, 
and people were using affirmative action to say, well, aren't you grateful to have a job, yes. you know, and that should not have been the case. So right. that's, that's that certainly was not the uh, goal or purpose of affirmative action. Right. It exactly. Was, you know, it was it was giving them an opportunity to do the right thing. And exactly. You had to pay attention to those situations that, you know, was not equally dealt with. Yes, exactly. All right. So so we're 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 we've got our new position. And what is this position called now? Well, then my I became an executive assistant in that department. You know, you think about all of the things that. Um, at one point or another, you, you, you looked at and said, hmm, you know, when I was in grammar school, um, you know, my brother and my sisters and I, the four of us, um, plus another family that had two, two kids, it was six of us in the whole grammar school that were African American. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our, we had to relate to everybody else. Um, so we were early on um, experiencing relating to people who didn't look like us. And, um, you know, those were the years that, you know, my mother uh, raised us and we were living in the projects. It, living in the projects and going to a private school was, you know, pretty unique, you know. And um, in my high school years, same thing. There was just a handful of us that were african Americans. So you related to all um, different types of people and different um, ethnicities. And, you know, one of the things I think about we were we were really fortunate because uh, the voices of us, and that included people that were Latina, that included people that were Asian. You know, it was a whole mix of us, um, Native American. Um, but there still in Filipino, there was still this small small group of us. Um, our school presentation was known for its um, theatrical performances, and so they would do Camelot. You know, they do these amazing historical plays and you have you know hundreds of people coming to our theater to see it well the parts didn't call for anybody of color you know so 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 we say excuse me but you know how can we um you know go for a role that doesn't really reflect who we are and so they would allow us to create something around ourselves, you know? And so we did, you know, we did all these amazing things in the middle of these, you know, dramatical plays mm -hmm. that, um, I mean, there were several times it was written up in the, you know, the, the examiner or the chronicle, you know, because it was so unique. You yes. know? And so they point out in the midst of this amazing play was this amazing, you know, and we'd be a rainbow. Of folks that didn't look like us. And so I think all of those kinds of things and all of those kinds of experiences, as you said, and how you shared about um, mo upward mobility mm -hmm. um, and the fact of uh, being able to use that, that knowledge in my position yes. allowed me to, to step up. When you, there was a time, did you work directly for Royal Clay or did you? No. no. Um, okay. I met him and he became an amazing, amazing person in my life, still is mm -hmm. um, today. And um, and when I first got hired as a temporary person and walked in the door, he was walking out of the door. And so my first, you know, I was temp and, and he, you know, he came out with his swag that he normally had and I didn't know who he was. I was, you know, early 20s, and he, you know, he stopped and said hi. I'm sure that for him seeing a black person walking in the city hall was just as amazing as me seeing one walk out. Right. <laughs> Unique. And so, and so we, we <laughs> greeted each other, and um, he shared that he was the vice mayor at the time for the city of Palo Alto. So, um, you know, I was appreciative of him introducing himself to me. Um, and whenever he'd see me, he'd say hi. So um, I was appreciative also of just who he was. You know, I, I watched him from afar. And little did I know he was watching me from afar as well. Because it wasn't um, shortly after, probably nine years after I was in the position in the planning um, department, I was asked to apply for the assistant city clerk. City clerk's office was one of four council appointed officers, the city manager, the city attorney, the city auditor, and the city clerk. The city clerk supported the mayor 
and counsel. Um, so when I applied for that position, it was very interesting because because the I, I think of another influencer, um, Ann Tanner was a city clerk, and there were probably hundreds of municipal clerks throughout the state that applied for that position because it was a juicy position. Mm -hmm. And they had been city clerks in other cities, but Palo Alto paid more and was more prestigious in the middle of Silicon Valley. So there were city clerks that applied. And, you know, I was applying from inside the organization, you know, not having worked as a city clerk or uh, assistant city clerk, and she chose me. And so, um, you know, I'll never forget that, I believe. And, um, you know, I, I thought about her probably about six to eight months ago. Um, you know, she just came into my spirit. And so I uh, contacted the person who had worked before me in my position as assistant city clerk. She and I um, connected after we became trainers in another program. So I called her and I said, let's go down and take Anne to lunch. Um, she lives in Santa Cruz, and I said, you know, so I called her, and she was so ecstatic that I would remember her after all these years, you know, and she goes, I followed your career on Facebook and wherever I can find out about you, and it, you know, it struck my heart that, you know, I mean, just like with Roy, you know, that there are people that have made such a significant difference in our lives, so, you know, I want to be able to say thank you. Well, I know it, it must have warmed your heart to just to have to, to be able to let her know how she helped you. Because, uh, you know, I'm sure she did this. First of all, think about who she was getting. The yes. seasoned employee who knew all, <laughs> like I say, where the bodies were buried. And <laughs> she didn't have to train you on the protocols of the city hall and whatnot. Right. And, so why not? You, you were, were obviously the best candidate for the job. So I appreciated that. Yeah. I just, you know, I just wasn't sure. Yeah, I, um, I, And when I was selected, I was pretty, you know, ecstatic about yeah, that. So was imagine. everybody else in the organization. <laughs> so so <laughs> step, know, step back, people. <laughs> Gloria's oh, coming here through. We come, here we come. You know, and, and during that period of time, you know, um, you don't know who's watching you and who's paying attention to you. One of the things when I think about legacy, you know, I think on the fact that I stand on sharing, you know, and service and standing my ground and of course my faith in Christ. And I thought about um, one of the chief um, administrators over at Stanford mm -hmm. uh, who had appeared several times in the planning commission because of planning issues that affected Stanford, like, you know, Jean spoke about with Sand Hill. Yeah. Um, you know, he came to me and said, we'd like you over at Stanford and asked me to apply there. And, you know, I stayed with Palo Alto, but, you know, you just don't know who is watching and who's paying attention and, um, and whose eyes you follow. That's true. That is absolutely true. There's also something else that, uh, that I like to bring out, uh, being a, a diversity trainer and historian and researcher is unfortunately for this country we want to make each story each group of people a separate entity onto themselves as if they lived in this world all alone and That's right. had it not been for my european friends my hispanic friends my asian friends who took the risk and stepped out of their place and gave me an opportunity I wouldn't have made half the uh, things I wouldn't have done half the things I've done you know? I agree and, and what you're sharing is is so similar and aligned to my story as well because those doors that were open to me were open to me by people that didn't look like me because people that looked like me weren't in those positions exactly. to open the doors Thank and you. so you know, so we recognize that, you know, the there needs to be a gratitude towards those that were willing to take that kind of, of stance and, and to open the doors. Unfortunately, they had to because we weren't in a situation where it was equal. So right. the fact that we had that opportunity, I think, is crucial. And the fact that we recognized and didn't lose who we were, yes. you know, is also 
as critical and to recognize that um, those who follow us should also have the doors open. And I think one of the things, you know, um, Roy Clay played a significant role because once I got to be the assistant city clerk, he was no longer on the on the council, but I did keep him on the standing council, which was a council that would act in the, in the case that they couldn't get enough council members um, for an emergency meeting. And so, you know, from that standpoint, um, from that point on, you know, he just played a significant role in my life. And um, he watched my career grow and he was an encouragement. And so coming from an African-American man was just, you know, very, very powerful, one that was respected and deserved the respect of who he was. Um, you know, I, I, I can't say enough about who he was in the world. And when you talk about, um, you know, the opportunities and, and having to showcase, I, I recall, uh, when the city celebrated, Palo Alto celebrated its 100th, you know, birthday, um, like I said, the council and the mayors, I worked with over 30 mayors plus mayors and hundreds of council members, and they were all white, you know, and they supported me, and I was able to do some phenomenal things, and um, I think about one who, be, he was a council member, he became the mayor, he also um, was an assembly person and also became a senator, Joseph Minion, and when he was mayor of, um, of Palo Alto, he wanted to move up in the League of California Cities. And so, and I was a city clerk, so my office supported his, and his office was in my office. And so he, you know, he shared, he goes, well, you know, the League of California Cities, uh, the, you know, our department is responsible for programs on a quarterly basis. And he said, and he had called June and, you know, her staff person in, because she was a city manager. He goes, I was thinking that we would divide up the responsibilities. I was thinking <laughs> that we give... The city manager the responsibilities for programs and you know i was thinking the city clerk could handle the finances and registration and da 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 da, da. and so he goes so what do you think about that <laughs> i said well you know if you ask me what i think I, either the city manager should take it all or my office should take it off but i'm not interested in a split um, you know, I was not going to <clears throat> embellish my organization with thinking we're for clerical staff when we weren't. It's not going to happen. If you want me to take it, give me everything. And so she said, all righty then, you got it. You got it. <laughs> and, he, and I, you know, I said to him, I said, so what is your expectation? You know, and he said, one of my expectations is that um, when we have a program on a quarterly basis, he said, you know, from Sacramento um, all the way down to Morgan Hill. He said, we end up getting only 30, 30 plus council members coming, you know, and he said, I want to double that. No, he said, I want one, you know, to, to bring it up one third. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, got that. And so um, <laughs> the first program I had was amazing, you know, so um, I was good friends when I tell you that I was a part of a training of trainers program, I was in that program with a number of people that were amazing. And one of the trainers was Ted Gabler, who was the co-author of Reinventing Government that was used by Clinton and, and Gore in their administration. Well, he was a friend of mine. Uh -huh. So so I said, I'm going to get him to be, you know, the speaker at this, at our first event, right? And so I um, called him and you know, he was, he was in Central California, and I said, I need you to come up. I need you to pay your own way and, you know, get a hotel room and pay that, too. You know. <laughs> I have no budget. <laughs> no budget. <laughs> and I need you to see. And our first, um, our first one was over 100 people. So we've gone from 30 to <laughs> over 100. It was phenomenal. And, you know, of course, Joe was he, you know, fit, yeah. you know, he's just so excited, and so um, after that, he uh, he said, uh, "Yeah, you know, run with it." And so when he, you know, he was the vice president of the league, and then he became the president. And you know, with the president, he wasn't supposed to be doing um, programs anymore. Mm -hmm. And they said, "Oh no, we want you to continue <laughs> to take that on." You know, so when he. 
was going out of office, they not only celebrated him, they celebrated me for the programs that I had did. So, you know, so it, it's interesting to think about, you know, don't allow ourselves to be put in boxes. Don't allow ourselves not to have, to be able to show, and I'm not just talking about myself and not in a way of saying I, 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 I just think that there's so many things that we do that we don't acknowledge and we don't see that we have the opportunity to see and do. There's another piece too, Gloria, and that is um, being able to speak frankly and openly to power. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And when you learn that, and I think if you come up through the ranks, as we all have, I think you learn very early because of the knowledge you have about those positions and those responsibilities that you can speak to power and let's put them back on track. That exactly. Kind of, you know, exactly. Kind of and, and get and open up their eyes, you yeah. know, because it's not that they're thinking um, negatively. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just that maybe they're not thinking in a way that says there's a broader picture to this, you know, to this thing. At the same time that I um, was the assistant city clerk before I became the city clerk, um, I my son, like I said, he had the learning issues, disability issues. And so I was trying to get him into Palo Alto schools because I thought if I could get him into Palo Alto schools, he'd have a better education. Well, because he had um, developmental issues, they were not going to take a child that they had to put more resources into. Mm -hmm. But what ended up happening out of that is that they asked me to work, um, I got called and was asked to work on some legislation that affected children with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And so as a young parent, um, I participated in those conversations and the legislation eventually um, was uh, adopted. And so um, then I was asked um, to be one of the folks that um, applied to serve out an unexpired term on the Santa Clara County Board of Education. And um, at that time, I was like 27 years old, 26 to 27 years old. And so I, uh, okay, you know, like I said, I, the door opens, I'll go through it, you know. And so I interviewed, not thinking that it would go very far because, you know, I thought, I'm not going to go with a young person. You know, this is a, the Santa Clara County Board of Education was, you know, it included the all of the districts in the county and four college districts. It was over 140 programs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And so, um, but it was for an unexpired term. And I think that they thought, oh, you know, so they ended up appointing me to the unexpired term. So I was in that position and then I ran for three terms and was elected three terms, <laughs> along with being president for twice you know, two of those three terms. And, um, and that was interesting as well, because as you said, you know, when you have the opportunity to uh, be in these positions where you, you learn, I quickly learned something that stuck with me throughout my career. And even when I came here to San Francisco was the fact that as an elected official, um, you know, when you're making decisions, you need information provided in a way that can help you get to those decisions. You need strategic information, not garbage, but strategic information. And I recognize that when I sat on the other side and I was an elected official, what was missing that I needed. And I also was able to give that information when I needed to provide reports and things to the elected body that I worked for. So, you know, so again, it was a gift. I understand that you have a consulting firm now. Is that correct? Yes. So how did you, first of all, how did that come about? And what are your business objectives and the projects that you're involved in? Okay. Before I get there, one of the things that I wanted to share, because I think this is so critical, especially in this day and age, I saw my position as a, as a city clerk, as a secretary of state on the local level, because we took care of political reform act. We took care of the elections. Um, you know, we were responsible for the legislative history of the city. And when I think about what's happening now with our voting rights, yes. I think that the local officials in these cities need to be given more strength and more responsibilities, whether they be city clerks, or county clerks, those that are responsible for these elections need to be recognized because 
you know, we talk about voting rights and we talk about voting needs and all of those things at all of these levels. Right. But when it comes down to it, um, it's the cities, it's the, it's the, the people that operate at the local level where these people are coming in with their ballots. I mean, I, as a um, election officer in Palo Alto, it was crucial for me to do um, voter campaigns. I mean, I felt a responsibility, even though we had a high percentage, that there were people that were still being left out of not voting. Yes. You know, so early on, I had absentee ballots that I had put in every free newspaper. You know, so mm-hmm. that people didn't have to necessarily come to City Hall. They could open up that free newspaper in the stands and find an absentee ballot and fill it out. You know, um, I did all kinds of um, voter books. And, you know, we were a charter city, so it was important for me for people to know the initiative process, the referendum process, the recall. You know, all of those things were extremely critical yes. to me. Um, in my position. And so, you know, so again, I think that it's, um, when we're talking about, we, we, we have this view of the Secretary of State and what that means. I don't think we think too much about the city clerks at the local level and their incredible responsibility. As, as we move through this voting and, and thinking about that and how can we um, how can we affect that? You know, I, I think the voices ought to be listened to and heard and, and challenged to, to come up with that. So, again, you know, there were so many things I was asked to take over the cable franchise, which was, uh, you know, something, again, that nobody expected. You know, it was in another department. It was in the technology department. And, um, and she was leaving and they said, you know, would you take over a portion? And I said, no, give me the whole thing. So yes. I was responsible for the cable franchise for not only Palo Alto, but for Stanford, for, for Mountain View and for East Palo Alto and a portion of San Mateo County. Mm. So again, it was, a, you know, another um, learning opportunity for me. And as I said, I served for 13 years on the school board. So I had all of these experiences from which to draw from. Um, and then I got appointed by the Board of Supervisors here in San Francisco. And that was unique as well because um, there were over 100 applications um, for that position. And I was, um, I was appointed by the full Board of Supervisors. It was the first unanimous vote of the Board of Supervisors for that position in 100 years. Wow. It was the first time it was a woman and it was the first time it was a person of color. And so, you know, and you know, and I know the Board of Supervisors, when you get a unanimous vote, you jump up and shout. You know? <laughs> <That's true. laughs> there are all kinds of diverse, you know, opinions with the Board of Supervisors. Exactly. And I was even, I was one of the last questions that was asked of me in that interview was, you know, um, Barbara Coffin was the president of the board at the time, and she said, we are very, di- and she used the word, she said, we're a very diverse board. She said, what if you're appointed by um, a split vote? You know, and she asked that question of me, how would you respond yeah. to that? Yeah. And so I um, I shared my response. And, you know, the first question I had when they told me I was appointed, which was, I said, so what was the vote? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. How many were on my side? <laughs> How many are going to stab me in the back on the way up? Oh, my gosh. You know, and working there, I mean, at one point, and you probably are aware of this as well, you know, three of the supervisors who ran for mayor. That had never happened in the city. Wow. And I was working for all three of them. So I had, you know, three of them, you know, um, Matt Gonzalez and Tom Amiano and Gavin Newsom all running at the same time. Wow. And, of course, I needed to stay apolitical. And each one of them said, if I become the mayor, I want you to come with me. And, you know, one of them said, well, you don't have any choice. And I said, I always have a choice. You know? <laughs> Let's not forget that part. <laughs> Let's not forget that. You know? and, uh, and when Gavin was made the mayor, you know, the first thing that I had was to have his chief of staff come over and offer me the city administrator's position, which I chose not to take. Yeah. And you're talking about my organization, my business is Young and LeMay Associates. Mm -hmm. We do strategic planning. We do diversity. I created a couple of programs that 
that have gotten international attention. When I was with the city and county of San Francisco, one of the things I noticed when I first got there was that people were working in silos. Um, and because of the union um, influence, you know, people didn't want to share their work because they wanted to have job security, right? right? And so I walked in this organization, which was not easy. Even though I had a unanimous vote, I was coming to an organization where there had been, you know, the, my predecessor had been there for years and years, well-respected. And, um, and people, they were used to upward mobility. And then I come from the outside coming in, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so the board was bringing in someone that had not been in the city and county structure. So my coming in was, was very unique. Um, to the city, I began working on programs that would break down those walls and um, allow folks to share information and to have uh, opportunities to shadow people in positions that were above them so that we would be able to move them up should that position become vacated, they could have the opportunity to apply. So that got international attention. I was also asked to be a part of a future of work group that only had private corporations involved. And I was asked as the only government um, to be involved because of the programs that I created, which got me um, international attention. Mm -hmm. And um, I was able to go and present in South Africa and work with a number of cities in so uh, South Africa. Um, and because of that, and because of the work that I've done, which was knowledge sharing, knowledge transfer, and the shadowing program, um, and, and also implementing in my organization um, that cross training and um, you know, critical business processes being documented and able to be shared, I recognized after I was gone for a month and a half to South Africa to do some training, I took a leave of absence to go there vacation. When I came back, you know, um, I recognized that the people that I trained my organization had done a phenomenal job. One of the things I said to them was, you know, we've crossed train, you know, you guys could pick up where I leave off and buy, you know, and I said, so what I need on my desk when I get back, I don't want to have any list of emails, any list of phone calls. I want a folder that gives me the hot buttons that I need to be aware of in terms of political issues that I need to respond to when I come back. There was one thing on that list, oh. one, after a month and a half. And I thought, you don't need to be here anymore. <laughs> but I also recognized that it was a perfect time to leave, to start my own company, um, to get out in the world, and that's what I did. And so your company basically... Uh, duplicates what you were able to do for municipalities all over the country, all over the world. Right. Um, yes, yeah, cities um, and counties in the state, uh, being able to show them how to go about setting up programs that shadow people, allow people to work in um, in teams, you know, so that the work was shared. Because when I first came to the city, uh, there was a crucial group that supported the legislative uh, committees, uh, a group of legislative clerks. And, you know, I got there and they said, well, so this one person is not here and none of us knows what, how to do that. And I thought, that's not good. That's not going to work. You know? <laughs> and so being able to just kind of um, look at that and pay attention and find ways that we could open that door up. And then, you know, we, we, line my whole conference room all the way around the wall with every job description, and we're talking hundreds, mm -hmm. and looked at, okay, how do we have people be able to cross into some of these other positions and without having any negativity from the unions? And I, I spoke to the unions in advance after I had yeah. done all that work yeah. so that I could keep down any um, bubbling up issues that might occur, and that's what happened. What you really did was break down the walls within an organization Amen. and gave it visibility across lines. And that is probably just the opposite of what a union would ask for. You, that is uh, amazing that you were able to work with unions because San Francisco is a union town. And I appreciated that and I respected it. And that's why, you know, I had my conversations initially with them. And I said, you know, one of the things that struck a chord was the opportunity people to be able to move up. I really felt strongly 
that I didn't want to put something in place and then have it be, um, you know, not able to go forward mm -hmm. because of not having taken that time to get them on board before I did that. Um, as a result of that, I wrote, I authored a book, Knowledge Management Tales. It's a tale of two cities from San Francisco to Johannesburg. And um, it's a book um, that is used in, in several cities. It was translated in, in um, Africa. As I said, I worked in Johannesburg and Pretoria and Durban, and I worked with the private industries there. Um, the South African Banking Organization and the Haoteng Provincial Government. After I left the city, um, and before I left the city, it was probably six to seven years of going back and forth um, to South Africa doing work um, in that area. When I was doing work in South Africa, one of the things was that um, I met a woman and we're at a conference, and she was um, white South African, and um, she was doing similar kinds of work in South Africa. So we partnered and wrote several articles, and that's what first got me to South, South Africa. And then she had a conference where myself and a person from Rolls-Royce International were the, the key speakers. So um, he appreciated the work that I was doing. Rolls-Royce International is in Derbyshire in England, and um, at the time, they only allowed two outside people to, um, to come into their organization to do training in a given year. And I was one of them. And so I got to go and um, it was phenomenal for me. You know, they took me through their huge museum areas where they showed all of their old Rolls Royces and all of the, you know, the uh, hangers and the things that they had created for the jets. And, you know, I, and, and for me, it was wonderful. I kept thinking my brother would be jumping up and down, you know, <laughs> but I could just see him, you know, being a guy, just being like, what do you want <laughs> This is like Disneyland. <laughs> but, you know, I was blessed to, to be able to um, to have those opportunities yeah. as a result. And, and so I, you know, I don't lose sight of that. You know, I just don't lose sight of any of that. And, and you talked about diversity and I created a program around diversity um, that I shared when I was training with others in the continuing education for public officials and um, it's the humanity model. Mm -hmm. And so that also was something that um, I used as well uh, in, in all of the organizations that I worked with, you mm -hmm. know, so, so those are the things that I bring forth when I'm, when I'm in my business. Gloria, my business that is some, that's just powerful, powerful information <laughs> about you. And you thought, what are we going to talk about? My God, woman. <laughs> You're just amazing. It's just amazing. I am just so honored to talk to you. And well, um, I'm honored to talk to you too, but I wanted to just share my last thing because I yes. don't want to end this without saying that, you know, I know my story has many facets mm -hmm. and, you know, I've shared the layers of successes, but I've had suffering. I've had pain. You know, I've had heartache. Mm -hmm. I've had disease and I've survived tri uh, trauma. And so that's really important too, yes. to, to, you know, to acknowledge that because that's who I am today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that is probably what gave you your strength to go through all of those things uh, and come out victorious. At the end. You know, in fact, one of the questions I had on here was what impact did your work have on your community? And, I would say uh, you gave me a, an incredible answer that, you know, it wasn't just your community, but the world. You have changed probably organizations throughout the world with your... Uh, well, I've been blessed to be, you know, I, I think when we open up our hearts and our minds and, I mean, like I said, as a follower of Christ, when we recognize that everybody that comes into our sphere has an opportunity to, to bring wealth to us. You know, and sometimes we close our eyes. We don't see yes. that that person standing right next to us, right to the right of us, is somebody that's really profound and could be offering something to you that you just say, oh, no, that person, not looking like I would want to get to know that person. And then you realize, you know, that that there's so much, um, so much opportunities, so many opportunities there, and so much that we could lose by not 
being open and, and, you know, I'm grateful to you because again, I think, um, as a part of this world, we're all, you know, we're all created as one. And so whether it's the European or the African American or the native, you know, when we think ourselves as being inclusive and not exclusive, yes, how powerful is that? Right. Right. Absolutely. Well, my dear, I think we have answered and solved most of the world's problems. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Oh, Gloria, no, let me thank you. you. Let me thank oh. you. Thank you, Gloria, for sharing your perspective on in-house organizational issues that translate to global solutions. Mrs. Young's book, Knowledge Management Tales, The Tale of Two Cities from San Francisco, to Johannesburg is available on Amazon. It was a pleasure talking and sharing your story, Gloria. Again, I thank you and thank you for listening. <laughs>